Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Unlocking Manufacturing Efficiency. My name is Carolina Haig. I will be your host and technical support. And presenting today will be Anders Swan. So hopefully you will see my screen now. Looks good. Looks good. Great. So, well, once again, welcome everybody to this webinar uh, around what I call unlocking true manufacturing efficiency using our solution, DPM, Digital Performance Management. My name is Anders Svan. I'm working to support our customers in a sales executive role uh, around digital transformation. So today, I'm actually going to talk about an introduction to the value of more hours in production, how we see that and the challenges that our customers in the manufacturing domain faces and the way maybe to move that into a better position and then going down to the solution that we call digital performance management. And then we will do a wrap up or Q&A at the end. So that's sort of the agenda for today. So as a start, when we work with our customers and we talk with them about their challenges and how they move in their digital transformation journey, it's many times around engineering and, and the R&D. It's also the uh, handover to manufacturing and also for services. So we mainly focusing, at least or, or originally, we, we focusing on PLM and CAD and, and product data management to, to manage for our customers together. We help them with change management and configuration management and product data management. Of course, moving into a life cycle thread, that means handing over data to downstreams like manufacturing and service. So the bill of material or the engineering bill of material and the approval of that moved into the manufacturing domain, of course, for producing. And then when it comes to the service, we normally look at things like spare parts management and helping our customers also to improve in the service revenue area in terms of service revenue growth and so on. And, and of course, remote connected machines and so on are more and more into the loop today in the digital world. But today, the webinar is going to focus more on the manufacturing side. So I will talk and, and present sort of the as-is situation for many companies in the manufacturing domain around efficiency and improvement in the efficiency. Uh, in that domain, there are, of course, things like asset optimization, workforce productivity, and quality improvement initiatives. But it boils down to the OEE, which is really overall equipment efficiency or effectiveness. So I will talk more about that. When we look at the manufacturing industry in particular, and the high level use cases, the top five use cases from, from left to right, we see that throughput is one very, very important one to maximize the operational efficiency, to increase the throughput. When we look at labor, of course, investing in your people and your, your employers at the shop floor to optimize their way of working efficient and removing non-value added task and be more productive in the way they work. In that regard, when it comes to maintenance, that's of course around concentrating and to able to the improvement of the maintenance in the production about machines or efficiency, but also the skill sets required to do those tasks in the manufacturing. And when it comes to quality, it's really improving the quality to reduce operational costs spent on both material and labor and target sort of the scrap reduction to impact material spend and also the, the, uh, the margin in the company. And finally, the asset optimization. Here we see that your investment in the machines and the lines and in your production is really key to use and leverage and to be able to monitor that and maybe connect them and use that as a capability for monitoring. It really reinforces all other four use cases. So that is really the underlying connectivity, which is really, really important. But going into these five use cases, what's really, really stands out, what's the most valuable one is really the, the, the throughput. So here it's, it's about really optimizing and putting hours back into production to be able to increase volume and lower costs. So it's really about revenue and cost reduction. Companies normally have an efficiency of or, or throughput typically in the range of 40 to 60%. A lot of companies call that sort of OEE, overall equipment efficiency. 
and world class to the right there is, is 85%. So most factories operate below their potential capacity. So there is sort of a gap of opportunities here as well. When we talk to and listen to analysts and we listen to also the management consulting firms in the world, like the McKinsey's and, and others, they have proven data points that companies can have a five to 20% improvement with or without digital. But what DPM is really doing is helps you to capture that five to 10 or to 20% faster without losing it. So DPM really identifies the bottlenecks and help you to, to gain that extra margin or, or volume. So, I mean, five, ten percent or 20% is, is a percentage. So let's make that more sort of real for you. So looking at what that might be as a value for a company when you improve those five to 20%, you need to immediately link that to what you call pro profit and loss. That cost or volume increase as, as I mentioned, that needs to be linked to the value. So on the left side here, we have maintaining the same cost, we can increase the volume to meet demand. So this could be growth. And the middle column is this, the same volume. So we have the, the demand, but we can reduce the cost. So either working in the numerator or the denominator of, of sort of cost per unit in the first two columns. And then the third column is rather than changing cost or volume, take that time you saved and reinvest in changeovers. So for example, double the number of changeover you are having per week, that will then decrease your inventory by half and it will shorten lead time by half. So it's more of a service level potential towards your customers. But how do you take that five to 20% and how do you take that lower cost and, and link it back to the profit and loss? This is really an illustration of a typical company, a very sort of classic company in the world of 5 billion in revenue. So 20% margin brings that down to 4 billion. 30% overhead takes us down to 2.8 million. So simplistically then of those 2.8 million, we divided 50% material and 50% labor for OPEX. So now if you take that five to 20% I mentioned and, and, and very conservatively apply that to the enterprise, if you increase revenue of a $5 billion company with those numbers, then very conservatively we, we are up on the top level about hundreds of millions at the enterprise level. So that has the right number of zeros, so to speak. If you look at the labor and all of your labor, this is throughput in your factories. And this is also five to 20% of the 1.4 billion. So that's again, hundreds of millions at the enterprise. So two largest sort of use case and value in, in around throughput. Now, if you look at uh, the uh, labor productivity and being direct labor only, five, 10% on that 1.2 is still over hundred millions. So it's a lot of value here. And then going down and everything else drops, of course, to tens of millions or millions. It's still great because that's a lot of value. So indirect labor here is, is tens of millions. And then on the left side, one, two percent of material being tens of millions. And if we go down to quality, which is really scrap, and we look at rework to create uh, and change things around scrap, it's really about the five percent of a rework, which is really a quality from a rework standpoint in, in millions. So all still very, very positive use cases, but what we like to do is really focus on the top ones, the, high, the hundreds, the hundreds of millions. And we would like you to focus on those as well and capture them and then fund all other use cases that really truly sort of transforms your operation and business. 
Well, I think that makes sense. And on as this is just an example of a company, but and where it's sort of that needs to be proven. But let, let me try to bring it back to why this works. OEE is extremely challenging for every company. Part of the reason is that this formula here on the picture, you have availability, you have performance, and you have quality. And, and they brings together adds up to what we call OE. And it works sort of mathematically, but it doesn't really work behaviorally because it's a percent, a percentage of something else. So in this case, availability, it happens to be rate. And you know, the, the performance is, is really units per time and quality is really the uh, unit number. So it's, it's three different percentages units of measure, and they all convert this together to, to another percentage. And as soon as you convert that percentage to something else, you lose the data and, and the details. So you're measuring something of 100%, but the data going in is typically in those buckets missing data. So it's not really complete. It's converted to something that looks complete. And then you take these three percentages and multiply them together and you get the fourth one, OE percentage as an index or, or another percentage, and now all the details is lost. So it becomes more of a reporting tool than, than real data and insights. I would like to just go through quickly how we think about this measurement of time. This is an example where we have to the left, one week of production. The maximum total hour, which is absolute, is 168 hours, 24-7. But the company doesn't work 24-7. They normally sch schedule their production in the way that they have unscheduled time and scheduled time. In this case, 80 hours production, two shifts Monday to Friday. On top of that, they might add another shift on Saturday, an overtime shift. So now they have a target production of 88 hours. And from that, reality steps in. We have these three buckets of availability, performance, and quality that makes us down, in this case, to the 45 hours. And within, within those availability buckets, there are areas like planned downtime, unplanned downtime, and changeovers. So in this example, the planned downtime, three hours, unplanned downtime 14 hours and change over 11 hours. So now we're down to 60. And then when you look at the performance, that's normally speed loss and minor stops. So now we're down at 46. And finally quality being scrapped one hour. So now we're down to an effective time for this company of 44, 45 hours. So this is really the performance. And we measure that normally in percentage as an OE in this case, 51% OE. When we look at a company, traditionally, it might look like this. This is a company that have different type of measurements, all these units in red of, on the availability or the performance or the quality don't make up, and the data inside those measurements are not really real data. So this is an example where we have a customer running 4,400 units per week. And that means when they run 70 units per hour in cycle time, they have 63 hours effective time. They schedule 88, but they run 66, 63. So that's a, a traditional OE of 72%, which is really in the high range of the spectra. But is it real? They don't know and they don't really know what to improve to increase it. It's just a reporting tool. So the reason for that is that speed, cycle time, is really represented as just 70 units per hour, in this case, in this bell curve to the left. So best demonstrated speed is really 100 units per hour, and they don't know. So that's the challenge when you don't measure everything in, in, in an absolute way. So we are trying to, to work through that by 
moving into a scenario where we can uncover the, the real challenges or real bottlenecks. So here's an example of the same customer using DPM. They're still at, you know, let's go back. They still use 4,400 units per week and 100 units per hour in cycle time. That's effective time 44 hours. So they were at, at 72 and now we're down to 50. But at least they know where they are, the baseline. So for example, here we can see that the speed loss when we were at 72 is two hours. But when we measured it using DPM, we found that we had additional speed loss here in pink of seven hours. And we had additional small stops of three hours. And sometimes those minutes or hours are not measured. And an example from a customer in US using DPM, they said that we don't report anything less than three minutes. And when they measured it on a daily basis, dynamically through DPM, they found out that those three minute stops, they occurred over a hundred times per week. And that totaled for more than five hours production. So it's really important to really understand where the, the bottlenecks and the hours are spent. So now what we also see here is that DPM measure this everything in hours. It's one unit of measure. It's absolute. And then you subtract down from that. So here, when we subtract these seven additional and the three additional small stops, we're down at 53. And the difference from 53 and, and 44 is nine. So they had another bucket of, of hours, unaccounted hours of nine hours, which is more than one shift that they were not aware of. So this is just an example so that DPM could visualize the data in a way so that you can make better decision. And this unaccounted time is most likely, you know, it's likely small stops or, or speed losses or something that is not measured correctly. But it's great to know because now we can sort of problem solve it. So let's go down one level and look at this bit in a more detail. So DPM is all about understanding the bottlenecks. So as I was just going through, we were looking at the item here at two o'clock in the waterfall. But let's start really in the center of the page here, the, the production dashboard. This is an hour by hour chart for an operator and it's configured for every single product you make. So you can have tens of products running down the line uh, each product has its own speed, its own downtimes, its own losses. And this could be by crew, by team, by shift, or any day in the week. For all that is configurable and makes it understandable to be able to, to look at the processes and the bottlenecks. So now when we capture all that data, I then go to the 12 o'clock to the bottleneck identification and, and looking at the bottlenecks. So in this scenario, let's assume that there's a plant of 100 assets. And one of those assets is the bottleneck, sort of the pacing limiter for, for the plant. So go to that one, not the 99, and then go to that one and understand how to de-bottleneck it. So you're finding that priority asset or line or cell, and for every bar here at 12 o'clock, you have this waterfall at two o'clock. So saying that I want to save eight hours, I want to eliminate an overtime shift. Now that's eight hours, I need to go to the two categories. So now I go down to the Pareto at four o'clock to analyze what is contributing the most to the left here in this case. Those are hours that we identified. So for those two categories, we looked at the eight hours. So the target is really to decrease that. So I have to go down to the Pareto diagram and I, then I have to find sort of five hours in this column and then the three hours here, which is the eight hours. And the target sort of settings and the problem solving is thereby sort of built in. And the goal is to remove the eight hours. It might be worth millions in the overtime. So now I know on an operating level, eight hours, but I also know on an enterprise level, millions. So everything is sort of linked together. And once I know what to solve at the four o'clock, I can then go to the six o'clock to the action tracker and look at 
this is just sort of Peter's doing something on, on Wednesday or, or Mike doing something on Friday. Did we improve? Did we change something? Did the trend line change? So are we reaching our goal? We wanted eight hours. We made this change and we captured sort of three of the eight hours. That's good. Let's go and check again to see, are there more actions or did we not accomplish what we want to do? So either way, we can see that the scorecard at nine o'clock and we can come back to the bottleneck and say, did we improve the bottleneck enough to shift the bottlenecks to the next bottleneck? If not, let's go around the circle again. If yes, let's go after the next bottleneck. So this becomes sort of the continuous improvement, but it's in continuous improvement on the number one asset, not the 100 assets. It's the number one asset at, of the bottleneck. So it really makes a laser sort of focus on the, uh, on the, uh, on the actual prioritized bottlenecks that we want to achieve and, and gain the value from, as I, as I mentioned earlier. It's a lot of, of sort of built in best practices around Lean and Six Sigma in this solution. And this is an example of how the data is sort of laid out. And there's a common goal that we want to make those or, or get after these sort of eight hours. But we have different areas of expertise. So to capture those eight hours, maintenance here represented in red, they might be working on the unplanned. And the continuous improvement team in, in pink here, they might be working on the speed losses and the unaccounted. And in the unaccounted, they want, they want to monitor that, that and, and capture that data in a better way. Maybe they have to add a sensor or something in the machine that could capture that data automatically. But they're also working on speed losses. And then operations in, in yellow, they're working in, in changeovers and try to move everything closer and practice the, the, the decrease of the changeover times. So now you have sort of three to four groups working together with one goal of eight hours, each sort of sharing some of the responsibilities and, and working together as a single team in a single source of truth. And that is sort of a lot of power in that, in the concept. DPM also sort of reinforces what you're most likely already doing. There is some type of huddles at the shop floor for sure. There might be some type of uh, continuous improvement or CI prioritized activity going on. There is some type of, of tracking of improvements and there is some type of, of benchmarking for sure. Maybe some metrics, some reports or something put at the desk at the operator in, the, in a screen with KPIs and so on. So DPM is really enforcing all that, but we do it in a single source of truth in a format that is easy to understand, hours. So a frontline worker might think about hours as being 100 units. And mid-level management, they might look at it and say, hours in one week, that's, that's 4,400 units back to my previous example. A plant manager might look at this and say, that's the cost per unit. I'm spending millions in overtime. And then a vice president might look at this and say, within my BU, my business unit, I have this sort of high cost facility and low cost facility. And I want to increase the volume and shift to my low cost facility and increase the volume there. But how could I improve the capacity in the low cost facility? And the C-suite, the executive level in the company, they might look at this and say, we promised our owners 100 millions in margin, but where are we gonna capture that information and that? Is it with this plant, this BU, or this line, or this product segment? So everything is sort of linked from the shop floor to the top floor and back again. And that's what DPM is, is really doing. It's this sort of cascading metrics. You're using this at every level. 
So a frontline operator looking hour by hour, senior management are looking site by site or product by product or, or line by line and to capture so the right level of, of savings. So everything rolls up at the enterprise. So if it's 1 million in savings in overtime or more for one facility, and we have 20 facilities, that's 20 million per year in savings. So the scalability here and the usage of, of DPM really adds that enterprise global value also for, for a corporation like a company with, with sites in many, many areas. So let, let's summarize a little bit. I think part of the value of, of DPM is to deliver this sort of closed loop, self-monitoring, self-correcting, did we fix the bottleneck approach? Yes, and then move to the next bottleneck. So you always have a new baseline and that's really, really valuable and, and powerful. Together with advanced analytics and BI, we can also see patterns and do problem solvings. And finally, with the bottleneck analysis that's embedded, you focus on the number one bottleneck, not the 99 or anything else, that sometimes mostly doesn't deliver the right, the right value. So you're focusing on the, on the one bottleneck with the highest value and potential, moving those three or five or eight hours down, and then you take the next bottleneck as an iterative continuous improvement loop. DPM also have this sort of element of understanding and learning. So it's really understanding the root cause of problems. And then with an action plan, really communicate that within the organization that's sort of transparent and based on the same measurements, in this case, hours. And then last but not least, let's say we saved a million and, and we spent 200,000. It's very nice to be able to say that we spent 200,000, but we capture 1 million or more. There's a 5X ROI to that and that might happen in three, four months. So now you have this sort of built-in business plan or, 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 or data that, could that you could share to the company and to the, to the executives team and turn into a business case. And also share that on a common ground of, of the savings in terms of hours and then mapping that to, to money. So I think that's, that's really key. Um, how is DPM different? Well, it's really built from 20 years from McKinsey originally, and then brought into this application with all the knowledge that it was invested over many, many customer examples and customer cases around those 20 years. From a system view, this sort of continuous real-time closed loop, self-monitoring, self-measurement sort of solution is really unique. And then time as currency, a time-based performance, not percentage, which is not absolute, but time. And really the approach is not to sort of rip and replace, it's really wrap and extend. So use your existing equipment and assets and data, and then build with DPM on top of that as an application. And this, of course, a holistic way of, of looking at this. So we focus on solving your problems and prove value step by step by removing the bottlenecks. And then at the, at the right side, the impact, of course, focusing on the faster value, the most pressing sort of high value use cases first, and then take the next, next one per, per se to, to improve that. And, and really fast to value to create those hours and get them back and put them into production again and put them into dollars or, or, or million sec in, in Swedish. So deployment in month, not years. So it's really about fast to value as well. I would like to close with some customer example. Uh, this is a, uh, Brembo is a, is a customer of, of PTC in this case, a global customer. Uh, and uh, they work 
as a leader in design and development and production of braking systems and components for cars and uh, motorbikes or and then industrial vehicles. They also are uh, developing and an, as an original equipment manufacturer components to the automotive industry and to the racing. So their their brake system is red. So have you seen one in a car? It's it's from Brembo. The challenge they had is that they had more than 40 facilities across four, 14 countries. And all those had different type of processes and equipment. And Brembo had very little insight. They had a lot of data, but the data was just overwhelmed. It was too much data and they couldn't really capture that in a good way. So they, they couldn't change the data to information and then to insight. But capturing that and using underlying technology as our thing works sort of IoT platform and Kepware to connect the machine, they could then up, use the DPM solution on top of that to, to analyze the data and integrated also different data sources and automate that and presented that as a daily dashboard and using DPM also to improvements. So they saved more than $1.5 billion in 2020 with improvement in the operational efficiency with improved OE. And they decreased scrap and rework while improving the uptime and the machines and the throughput and quality. So now they have a global rollout plan to really use this as a global solution with the whole Brembo facilities. Really interesting. Um, I would like to end really by uh, opening up after this as with some questions, but before that, I think as a customer reference and, and a video, I would like to uh, present uh, a video for you that you can uh, download. Uh, I we will paste it in the link. I think Carolina can do that in the, in the chat so that you can then look at this video. It's a four minute video of a company self uh, that really leveraging DPM to add value of DPM. And uh, it, it really also presents some of the things I've talked about, how the action tracker and how the bottleneck analysis and the waterfall really are used in their daily business, how to improve uh, and de-bottleneck and make things in a more efficient way. So a good video that we will share also after the webinar. Um, so that really, I think I'm a bit of time ahead, but that's good. So we can really wrap up and, and uh, open up for questions. Um, so I will just give you my details if you want to get back to me personally uh, mm -hmm. with uh, notes or comments or, or sending me an email or if you want to know more about the solution of DPM. Uh, so this will be shared as well. So Carolina, maybe you could yes. take over from there. Yes, let's go with the questions now. We have a really interesting one here from Jon Mobari. When the bottleneck is removed, are there any tools or methods within PDM for suggesting where the time saved could be placed? In his opinion, one cannot claim that time slash money is saved until the saved time is put into another operation that adds value to the operations. Yeah, I, I think I understand and he, he, not PDM, DPM, I think he meant the, the digital performance management solution. Well, the time when we capture time and we identify that we have a bottleneck and maybe we can do some initiatives to, to remove that bottleneck and, and capture those eight hours. Of course, once that's done, and we change something in the machine or the setup or at the operator, or we maybe we have the materials uh, set up differently so the machine can be more in, in a productive mode. Then we can realize, and when we then run everything again, continuously during the week or during the weeks, we can see an improvement in the action tracker that now that bottleneck is not anymore. It's not there. Th those eight hours has been gain and put back in the in the process and that could be translated to more volume or less cost in the shift so i think mapping that balance that's a decision that you as a customer need to do if you want to increase the volume and and utilize the machine more or if you want to save cost by maybe removing one one extra shift so i hope that answered that question yes 
Excellent. Let's move on to a question from Douglas. He has a question about a factory with extensive mix of automation systems and equipment. Can DPM be connected to such environment? Yeah, for sure. I think the connectivity is, is uh, embedded, so to speak, in the underlying technology. But then you could always also connect to other systems like your ERP or MES or other type of environments to, to collect that data. And that's, and that's the that's the idea with DPM and the dashboard in the center to, to understand live data from the machines. And some things in the factory might not be connected. So then there is an operator adding that into the user interface live directly instead of adding hours in an Excel sheet. You do it in the same system. So it's always capturing that data. Uh, so depending on the mix and how you produce, if it's more of an automated assembly line or if it's manual assembly, it might also different from factory to factory. So I would not say that all sort of automated use cases is preferred, but mainly when you have a production with a combination of products or, or changeovers or a, a machine that you want to raise the, the or increase the OE on, DPM is really, really helpful to, to, to give you that visibility and how to improve in your continuous work. And I think you should have also a continuous team already working before you implement DPM because that's, that's, that's sort of a given. And we have one more question here. Um, how easy is it to get started with the DPM? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Of course, that could be different from customer to customer, but in general, the solution is built so you can actually also run it through a SaaS sort of solution uh, already available. So then connecting the machines and the, the, the sort of equipment you have is one work you have to do. But in general, we've seen that together with PTC, our, our vendor, we see that getting started in a line and, and setting it up, configuring and getting the value and the data and the, the, the presentation that the customer wants, it's, it's between two to three months. So it's not years, it's months. Excellent. And that was the last question for this time. So thank you very much, Anders, for a great presentation. We woke a lot of questions and thoughts, and this is an exciting area that we are approaching. Perfect. So thank you, everybody, for particip participating today, okay. and we will thank see you, you another time. Have a nice bye day. Bye. bye.